Go for it. So, Doc, can I do your, before you roll your opening animation, can I do your opener? Yeah. Welcome to the service clinic at Low Country Harley Davidson. I'm Kevin Baxter, and this is Doc Harley. Hello, everyone. Yeah, this is something <laughs> new for me. Um, I have my own YouTube channel. Kevin has his own, too, and he had a great idea. He comes up with a lot of great ideas. But he called me and said, hey, you want to do something together? Sure. I've not done that before. That's something new to the YouTube channel. And it made sense because we both love the product. We love Harley-Davidson. Yes, we do. Absolutely. We, we love everything about getting into the win. We love taking care of people and making their dreams come true and yes, also sir. making them uh, feel good about their motorcycle and what it makes it their motorcycle. So we wanted to get together and talk about it. Absolutely. Now, we come from two different worlds, and I don't know if everybody on your channel, since we're simultaneously putting this out there on mine mm -hmm. and yours, I don't know if they know me, and i am they'd have to live under a rock to not know you on my oh, channel. Sweet. But, all right, so I'm Doc Harley. I've worked at Low Country Harley Davidson for 35 years. Um, the dealership is all I know. And I have owned, my first Harley was a 1959 Panhead. And then I had a cast iron Sportster and then Evo. And now I have a twin cam and I'll probably have an M8 eventually because the M8 motor is just amazing. It wasn't until the M8 motor came out that I was able to produce 150 horsepower, 150 torque and ride it in the street. I remember the shovel heads I built. You couldn't ride it every day. You rode to the bar and you rode back and you hope it started when, when you were ready to go home. That's right. So um, I have the experience of working from pan heads all the way to M8s. Uh, but I've also worked only in the dealership where we offer the product directly from Harley Davidson. I've had the wonderful, uh, uh, I don't know what do you call it, experience or just the availability of having parts that were manufactured at the company for the motorcycle. So when I have a sissy bar or I have this, I know it's going to fit. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have to bring out the welder or a cutting torch or something like that to make something work. And then I've worked with a lot of fantastic guys over the years in the service department, and we've all shared our experiences. Uh, one of the greatest experiences that techs have is going to rallies. Boy, when you go to a rally, you have the 10 of the best around you and you share experiences and share how to do things a little bit faster, a little bit better, and you become a better mechanic. So all the experiences that dealerships have given me has been awesome, but I've always wanted to go to your side of an independent shop because an independent shop can build a turbo, can build a pro charger, can, can push the limits on every motor that has been um, made by Harley Davidson. And you also have the ability to choose parts that uh, help a Harley Davidson endure over years when you are pushing the limits right. on it. Tell the people a little bit, I, I don't want to start from your nine year old stories, but <laughs> tell people about Kevin Baxter to my people that watch on my channel. Yeah, absolutely. So um, our paths aren't entirely different, they're just in different areas, yep. right? So, uh, you know, started out in engine building at a very young age. My education rolled into engineering. Uh, as I got in, I really started out in the automotive world, right, to a large degree. But what a lot of folks don't realize is there are companies in the motorcycle industry that overlap in the automotive world. Yep. Gaskets, injectors, you know, belts to pistons, cams, you know, th there's a lot of overlap there. Yeah. So then I started building relationships with those motorcycle companies uh, doing R&D development. Uh, product testing, uh, destructive testing. I remember uh, when a, a, one of the first aftermarket transmissions came out, one was given to me as well as a couple other drag racers because I had a, a 200 horsepower Pro Charger 107 in a bagger and the challenge was destroy the transmission, right? Woo. So uh, got the opportunity to do a lot of that. But um, And I also spent some time as a service manager in a dealership as well. And, uh, and after few years of doing that opened up to the retail public after that and started building engines and things. Now I'm, you know, still involved with product development and testing and everything else. 
And uh, I, I actually really enjoyed my time at the dealership. And, and the reason I took the job as a service manager was really to understand how the Harley system worked. Mm. I wanted to understand how warranties work. But the biggest thing is I wanted to understand what the limitations could be inside of a dealership, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that gave me a new perspective as I went on to you know, open up, up my shop and continue from there. And I, I'm with you. I, I absolutely love the motorcycle. I, I love the motor company. And, and I think that when, when you and I made the announcement that we were going to be doing this video, right, they were expecting us to come in with, yeah, you yeah. know, boxing gloves. Dealer versus independent. We're, <laughs> yeah, going at it. And, and you know, in our, in our conversation this morning, it, it shouldn't be that way. No. It absolutely shouldn't be that way for, for, uh, for various different reasons. And, and a lot of people don't realize that the, the aftermarket and the motor company actually has a closer relationship than people could imagine, really, to a large degree. Yep. And so it's in the aftermarket world, we are not bound by a lot of the limitations. We're not necessarily bound by CARB or EPA. We don't have to deal with the mass of the motorcycle necessarily, right? It's you have companies that handle certain segments of the motorcycle and that enables them to be specialists in that field. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a reason you have general practitioners and podiatrists and, you know, you, you have people that are in specialties. And, and that's one of the things that, you know, in the aftermarket that they can, you know, you can really focus on those things. And that symbiotic relationship that exists between the motor company and and the aftermarket. I mean, let's face it, what happens when Harley comes out with a new motorcycle? The aftermarket is scrambling for ways to make it better, right? And not necessarily because what you started with was bad, but the reality is not everyone buys a bike with the same purpose and goal in mind. Right. For, you know, for some people, it, it is a mode of transportation, but for some, it's their hobby. They want to make it their own. Some people are more driven by the twisties. Some guys prefer to go straight. Mm -hmm. You know, some want big horsepower. There's, you know, so there's all kind of differences. So that's what the aftermarket does. And then after a period of time, you know, Harley will watch that possibly a new market develop. Yep. Right. And when it's justifiable for them to take that concept into a mass production environment, they do. And then the cycle starts all over again. And it's it's wonderful. Yeah. Right. And, I, I know the company goes to the rallies. Of looks course. at what the independent shops have built and sees the crowd reaction. It took the longest time for a CBO Road King to show up. But when the people flocked at that machine at a few rallies, they went, hey, there is a want and a desire for it. So, yeah, the, the company watches independent shops. They watch the dealerships, what we put together. But you have hit the, the major part of it is there is a limit in what the dealership can do. We have warranty that we have to follow the rules on, on what we're building. Um, a lot of the shops, such as ours here, we have a fantastic service area, but we do not have the lathe and the mill and everything to make specialty parts. Uh, one of the things that I love about your independent shop is you give the capability of blueprinting a motor. Now, blueprinting hasn't been talked about in motors for a long, long time. When I was growing up, that's how we raced. We blueprinted the motor so we knew every part was going to last when we pushed the limit on every RPM on it. You have the capability of taking um, five different parts and going, okay, this one is the closest of tolerances in the build that I'm going to do. We have a 1998 Sportster up there. We did that. We bought five parts of almost everything on it and found the tolerance that would be the best for racing to hold up. It's like taking a donkey to the Kentucky Derby. You put a Harley on Daytona and doing that mileage and going wide open. You want the right. best of parts inside that motor to last Absolutely. that kind of point. So, yeah, as a dealership, I look at your shop. I watch your YouTube channel and I go, OK. I have a customer that wants to put this cam, this stuff, and wants to build a motor that is not the uh, company's 131, 128, 124. And it's always the customer's choice to build what they want. It's their choice how they want to build their motorcycle. 
And it's their choice to bring it to a dealer or to an independent. Right. But we both learn from each other. And you, working as a service manager, learn the attitude and the mindset of what the dealer can do, yes. but also what the customers are coming in and wanting. Right. And there's that, that symbiotic relationship that I spoke of between the motor company and the custom culture. Like, And, and I want to walk over and let you guys, because we talk about the Diablo. Yeah. They want, then I want to walk over and look at the little jewel that's sitting over there next to the door over there. Yeah. And, and talk about that. The Diablo. This, you know, we were talking about the that that symbiotic relationship, right, between the custom bike world and the manufacturer. It exists, even though a lot of times people don't even notice it. <laughs> Let, let's before we talk about this one, let's talk about a Street Glide. Okay, Street Glide was number one highest selling model for yeah. Harley Davidson, with, without a doubt. We know that what a Street Glide was was an electric glide with a black valve train lowered one inch. Mm -hmm. That's what everyone did to Electroglide standards, right? Yep. But Harley saw that need. They dropped the bike an inch. They put a black motor on it. Nice set of gauges. Like in your, the, the what, the, well, really the ultra gauges, mm -hmm. right? A full set of gauges. And it created a whole new line and a huge demand. This bike right here is probably what I think is the motor company's best response to market demand. Absolutely, without a doubt. Paint, the flake, the pinstripe, the pinstripe pattern, the logo on the tank, the short tinted windshield, the inverted front end, dual discs up front. They basically built a factory performance motorcycle. Yeah, custom. Right? A custom bike. And it's it's incredible. So, granted, it's modern, but let's go look at an FXRT, the FXRT that you've got started. right here, right? Where yeah. it all started. Okay. So, you know, the, the aftermarket world, independent, the custom bike world, We've been building bikes like that for 20 years. Yeah. But the market demand was small, right? There was, it was, it, it road glides and electric glides. That's what everyone was after. Right. But then we walk up and we see this beauty, right? So FXRT. Yep. Obvi the, the styling cues and similarities between this bike are absolutely, there's no question where they came from, right? Of course, right. that's a modern version of it. But so... This bike was available as a new bike to the custom world. This became the bike. Even look at the shape of the saddlebags. Yeah. Right? Everything. So it was, plus it was, it was an FXR, <laughs> right? So it was Lore. hot rods, you know, yeah. make it and use this as a platform for a custom bike. And that was kind of in the custom sub subculture for a long time. And it took time for it to develop. But even you guys built one. This one. Yeah. So... You take your FXR, you put your FXRT fairing on it, you put your bags on it, and it's a twin cam. Yeah. Right? So even you did it. Yeah. Right? So it was, once that demand got big enough, you know, you have the bagger racing league, you have all this stuff in the custom culture, all this. And then, and then when the internet came to be, you had more access to be able to easily see custom motorcycles and stuff. Next thing you know, people see the value in good suspension, good braking, and all the stuff that makes a performance bike a performance bike. And then you throw in the nostalgia aspect of this, and boom, Harley goes, okay, now there's enough market demand. Let's come up with an awesome factory custom. And that's what they did with that bike. I love that bike. It's, it's a fantastic way for someone to get into a bike that doesn't have to buy a bike and then spend another 50, 60 grand to make it custom. True. They can start with that, and then even at that point, make that one their own. Go bigger, go faster. Right. right, right, and it's got the comfort, it's got the reliability, and you've yes. got a fully custom bike with a two-year warranty. Absolutely. And so, yeah, you could park it right next to the old RTs and go, yeah, I'm, I'm continuing the heritage of Harley Davidson. Exactly. Just the new modern look. Exactly, and it's wonderful that that relationship exists. Yes, and and that's how it really works. It's not this, you know, let's duke it out with everybody all the time, right? right. You know, it's a good relationship to have. So, that symbiotic relationship that exists at that level that very few people know about, that same sort of relationship should be able to exist between guys like us. Yeah. Right? Because, I mean, let's face it. Yes, we, we have access to parts that you don't. Right. You have access to information that we don't instantaneously. Right? So when, you know, someone's buying, it's my opinion, it's no different than if we build, build a bike for a guy, a custom bike, or we build a, an engine for him. 
that 500,000 mile thing is very important. You know, bolts can come loose. We need to understand we are dealing with machines here, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, I have a saying at my shop, and I'm sure you, you operate exactly the same way. No one is perfect, but we strive for perfection to achieve excellence. We torque every bolt, every fastener. There's proper Loctites or anti-seize. Everything's used as it should be done proper, but things can happen. Things yeah. come loose. So if a person buys their brand new motorcycle, it's under that factory warranty, right? So that first 500 to 1,000 miles, I actually, even if a, an individual chooses to do business with an independent shop, if they buy that new motorcycle, I believe that they should still maintain that uh, some sort of relationship with you. And especially that first service should go back to a purchasing dealer, right? So right. That, that you have a chance, if anything, to do a stamp of approval, to it, you know, to go through it, look at everything, but that instant information you have access to, any recalls, tech bulletins, all those sorts of things, um, that's where those relationships should, you know, should come in. If, if you have a customer of yours that loves the work you do, but they want the opportunity to go outside of the, the catalog, right, right, you should be able to pick up the phone and call a shop like mine yeah. and us work together you without fear of me trying to poach your customer and me knowing that you're qualified to put that stuff together, right? And, and I think the inverse is true. If I have a, a customer in my place with a relatively new bike that has a problem I may have not seen before, it would be nice to be able to pick up the phone and call you and say, have there been any TSBs or anything like that? Because at that point, I'm really not going to try to fix it myself. I'm going to tell them, look, man, you're still under a factory warranty. Go back to your dealer, let them do this, stamp it, and certify it. So just with anything, even in, in the custom bike world, the relationships matter. And, and the more that we can promote good, healthy relationships, it's better for the industry as a whole. It's better for the sport as a whole. Because if you and I came in here with boxing gloves on, <laughs> right, the only person that's going to suffer is going to be the consumer. Yeah. And we want people riding these bikes, enjoying their bikes. For years we want their kids in the, and and i'll tell you an interesting story something that i noticed you know we there's no question that one of the biggest things that started the custom culture were the 60s bike movies yeah right okay right. easy rider set everybody gotta in, have in a frenzy and then over the years it tapered 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 and then boom the bike builder shows came on oh man it was hundred thousand dollar fat tire choppers yeah. and, and the and, the, and it got a boost again and a, i noticed a scary thing about a year ago I, uh, I've always been an avid bicyclist, right? So there was a day that you could go to a big department store and look at the bicycle section. Mm -hmm. Four rows, floor to ceiling, stacked with bicycles. And I went in there into a department store the other day, and they have one row of bicycles and about 15 in inventory. Bicycles transfer to motorcycles. Really? If it, I mean, imagine, you know... You're a small kid with oh, your yeah. swing, oh, and yeah. you've taped a card yep. into your wheel. Yep. It wasn't because you liked the sound of a card. It was because it sounded like a motorcycle. Very much so. And I think the more that we maintain our healthy relationships, it makes the industry better. It makes the product better. It makes the experience better for the consumer. And that's a big reason why I think we make our videos, too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Our, we make videos here at Low Country for information. Yes. We want you to know how something works. Uh, an example, when a person comes in, does his own research, forums or whatever paperwork, and he wants this cam in his Harley, we give the information of going, okay, great choice. You've made the choice, but there are things that need to support this cam so it will last in your motorcycle uh, over a certain lift. We need to change the valve springs. We need a different bearing to support that. We need different stuff here because we want you to be happy with your choice and we want you to go out and ride and enjoy what you put together. And it starts with you wanting something and we can make that dream come true. The gray area that you and I are going to talk about in the next episode of what is the VIN block and this new Federal Trade Commission agreement with Harley Davidson. What does it really say? What does it really do to the owner? Not do to the owner, but what does it allow the owner to do? And let's, let's clarify that. I'm Doc Harley. 
This is Kevin Baxter. We've got more episodes for you talking together, independent shop and dealers, and what we can do to keep your dreams going. We'll see you next week. You ready? Let's take care of yourselves and each other, and then you have to wave. Ready? Yeah. Got to do it. Ready? Take care of yourselves and each other. You, you have to close it because I opened it. Oh. Right? Oh. You have to close it. Take care of yourselves and each other. Okay. One, two, three. Take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Have a good one. <laughs>